Good afternoon, friends. And thanks for tuning in, whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening in. I'm going to suggest that if you're a regular podcast listener, that's great. I love that. But you might want to just pop over to the YouTube channel and take a look at this beauty sitting in front of me. <laughs> I've got with me today Chantress Fondren and I'm just going to say a little bit to begin with because I want you to hear her. She's got some awesome insight to share with us. But Chantress and I met on an online, because everybody was doing Zoom, um, apprenticeship program for coaching with the Enneagram. And shout out to the girl that helped us through this program, um, Vanessa, and with the Enneagram workshop, Vanessa Fernandez. And she's just been a godsend to both of us. I think you would agree, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Her approach to it all, it was just, even still, it's just so eye-opening. Oh, it was just such a gracious walk through this whole program. But I am going to ask you, Chantress, how did you find the Enneagram or how did it find you? I would definitely say that it, found me because to this day, I don't really know. Um, I mean, I was on Instagram for sure. And then I ran across an Enneagram account and took, um, took a test and it's still the one that I like to this day, just for kind of thoroughness, but I took a test and had my husband take it too, but I definitely thought it was like nothing I'd ever encountered before. Mm -hmm. I always have liked, you know, sort of personality type things, but it was so different. And I also thought it was really, really, it gave language to a lot of things that I had felt and experienced. Right. And it just kind of really caught me by surprise, but I was sort of bitten by the bug after that. I still, no one recommended it to me. It was just, I think based on certain content I liked, I, you know, something was recommended and that is how I, that's how I would say it found me. And I haven't really let it go since. And this See, was maybe like two years ago, two and a half years ago. Okay. And that's what's so good about social media, because that's how I found Vanessa. Somebody else had posted something and I was like, hmm, that's, that sounds like an interesting thing. And mm -hmm. so this is the beauty of social media. <laughs> we know there's some downsides. Yeah. So how did it go settling in on your type? I had um, really no, I didn't take issue with any of it. I thought it was all quite accurate. I didn't, even the things that are not necessarily positive. I'm like, oh yeah, that's accurate. This is, I didn't, I didn't have any, I didn't have any, um, I wasn't really disappointed or upset by any of it. It just felt like this, this is really accurate. Even if it's true, even if it's not super flattering, some of it, I feel like since it was, it felt true to me. So I'm like, well, if this is what it is, this is, this is what it is. And I can take that. I think the more I dug into it, um, I think now I have more, um, maybe like discomfort around certain things, but I also feel like I didn't, I also feel like I didn't take issue with any of it because I wasn't, um, super connected with how that shows up in relationship or what that's like for others. Mm -hmm. I felt like this is true. This is me. Here we are. <laughs> See, I think that's a very interesting observation because Let's spill the beans and let everybody know you are a type five. Yes. And so I love the fact that you're like, nope, I'm gathering the information. I evaluated. Yep. That sounds accurate because as we know, fives are really, really great investigators as they are called. And so it's not like, I feel like you probably approached it with a, um, okay, I need to know all the good things. And then if anything feels uncomfortable, that can't be accurate. Accurate. What you're saying is you're like, nope, nope. Fact check, fact check. Yep. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I see the world and respond to the world. Absolutely. And even my interest in like personality type assessment type things, it made even just learning more over the years about my type when it mentions at first I didn't really like when it when I would see things that were like emotions are a foreign language because that felt like incapability it felt like oh so you're saying that this is this part that I'm not 
really that understanding of, you know, it felt like something I couldn't handle, but in reality, like, no, that is true. And I think that's why I love the, why I would say I've gravitated towards things like that, because it's like, yep, a lot of that is foreign. And I like tools. I like learning about things that are foreign to me, (laughs) but emotions are a weird thing where it's like, you can learn about them, but you do have to like experience. (laughs) Right. Cause I remember back, oh my gosh, I don't even know what decade it was from, but there was a personality thing and somehow I ended up being, I think a golden retriever. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, oh yeah, I love golden retrievers. What the heck does that mean? You know, or, you know, which Disney character you, which, which golden girl. (laughs) And it's like, that's well, while that may be fun, it's those moments where you're, you know, it's kind of a gut punch and it's like, it was the same for me. It's like, what do you mean? I don't access half of my emotions. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. As a seven, that's, that's pretty factual that Mm -hmm. I do what I can to avoid the pain and grief. Well, once you know that, once you understand, like you were saying about your type, that emotions are not like, you're not running around with them on your shoulder all day long. Um, we can look at it. That's the power of the Enneagram is finding those spots where it's like, maybe I need to look into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you and I have talked many times online and after the, after we completed the course. And like I said, I just, I just clicked with you. I just, I, I love your energy. I thought I love you from like day one, like, who is this person? That's how, it's like, oh, and then I, I thought, okay, am I rationalizing that a type seven goes to type five insecurity? Well, this must be why we, you know, cause we share the head triad mm-hmm. and um, yeah, that's a great connecting point. But the more I heard your story and what you do just in life in general, that's where I was like, this message that we both have taken to our heart is we use it in different ways in our life. That is why I really want you to share what it is you do career-wise. I think you have a beautiful vocation. You have two. So can you just share a little bit about what it is you do? And most importantly, first of all, tell us what you do. And then second, and here's the most impactful thing, how you use the Enneagram in your world, in your whole world, without even using the word Enneagram. And this is my, it's definitely my favorite thing that has come about from Enneagram work, like how we've talked about, but I, um, so by day I work with two really incredible nonprofits. Um, one, I direct operations and then at the other, I do like accounting and HR. Um, But I'm also trained as a perinatal community health worker and a postpartum doula. And this year, um, I'm really proud of this, even like the mentioning of it, because I'm like, I don't, this feels like private, but um, I created Epic Parent Education and Consulting. um, And that was, you know, just kind of birthed from my belief that, that every parental figure can parent from a place of strength and providing opportunities to build real connections. Um, And the Enneagram like helps me with literally all of that. even for like my, like for my doula work, like the last birth that I attended that mom, I knew going into it that, um, I knew going into it that she was a type eight and that was just incredible to know. And she and I never had a conversation about her Enneagram type, which was, mm-hmm. I, which is my favorite thing. She took the test kind of way back. Cause it's also like, a, you know, it's also a family member. So we were just kind of chatting it up and that's how that happened. But I remembered that. And then forever later when it's time for her to have a baby and she wants birth support, knowing that she's an eight, um, let me know initially that she is going to be very instinctive, but that also means that she's really good at trusting her body. And she Mm -hmm. was so good at it. Even in the birth, there wasn't much that I really, she didn't need tons of affirmation. Like I just sort of needed to affirm what she was already doing because she's the one doing the work. Right. And then even with breastfeeding, she was so good at just trusting that her body would do what it needed to do. It's all, it almost felt like it never crossed her mind that it may not work or that she may not have enough milk or she just kind of eased right into it. And I, um, 
loved being able to support her in that way. She wasn't someone that needed tons and tons of information. I know tons and tons of things, but I didn't need to, I needed to give her just very basic info. Here's your section of the book to read, read these three pages. That's it. That's all you need. Don't ignore the other 200. If you need more, come to me, you know, if we want to do that. But I loved knowing that like, she is someone that has a lot of trust and confidence in her body and in what she can do. And that was able to like run the show that led the way for our interactions. I mean, it was just a beautiful thing. And even with like parent education, I'm not a fan of like coaching that term. Cause I feel like that's not really what I do. <laughs> I feel like I give people, I feel like I give people info. Inf- yeah. Yeah. I feel like I give them education and then they they decide how they want to do it. I can't really tell you how, but even with that, it's so helpful to know and to recognize even stances amongst people. I don't have to know your Enneagram type to be able to recognize sort of your stance when it comes to stress or problems. And I can tailor my approach to that to make my expectation so much more gracious of the person that I'm working with. That is a word that you used um, earlier in one of our conversations, gracious, what was the other word you expectations. used? Expectations. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Gracious expectations. I had encouragement in my head and that would one go. But mm-hmm. this is this is probably a phrase that if anybody takes anything away from this, gracious expectations. And excuse me for <laughs> dropping that ball right there because it is so powerful. And what you said about, we'll just take this type A, because you know because you have been through so much of your own growth and and understanding each of the types. When you said she trusts her body, well, interestingly enough, for those who may not, you know, pull that right off the top of your head, type eights are in the body triad. They, They speak first from listening to their own body. What an amazing gift to have a coach or a, a doula or whatever, even we don't even have to put terms to it. You're there to support her and you feel that energy. And that's what, and do you agree? It's mm-hmm. an energy, you pick up on the energy because you said stances. Yeah, that's energy. definitely. And for childbirth, anything like that, like your body really is, that's the perfect time to really have a lot of confidence in it and a lot of trust that it is going to do what it is literally like designed to do. And that, that's, there's such confidence because for me as a head type, I didn't have that same confidence when it was, you know, for my own childbirthing experiences and breastfeeding, like I wanted really too much information doing it, it, knowing now, if I knew now what I, if I knew then what I know now, it's kind of like, I would know that I need to just put more effort into like, into trusting that, that my body's going to be okay. Learning Mm -hmm. a lot is not going to increase my milk flow. You know what I mean? Like I need to just... (laughs) <laughs> wow, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah we like, can get so. overloaded with information. You and I have talked about that, that <laughs> obsession with, you know, and then the next thing, and let's learn a little more and a little more. Yeah. But again, this is part of our journey has been, okay, we know what we're, our instincts are, our natural flow. Mm-hmm. What are the, where's my heart connection? Where's my body connection? So have you ever... Um, worked with somebody who might have been like in, um, well, like somebody that you felt maybe was fearful of the whole process and Mm -hmm. you could feel that. And it's like, okay, I got to switch into this because did you recognize maybe this is her Mm -hmm. type? Yeah, I can. There was, so there was one birth that I supported. And of course, I think every I, I do think every birthing person at some point is like, I don't know if I can, you know, cause there's just so much happening. So there was kind of that, there was that portion, but it wasn't even the mom. It was the mother-in-law that was also at the birth. Oh, she hello. came in with a lot of, just a lot of fear and anxiety. So she's watching the oh. birthing process, but the entire time she's um, saying like, should she, I don't think she should be in this much pain or I should, I don't know if should she be doing that? Like, she just had a lot that she was bringing into it. So for me, no, like I could, but I could tell that she just was, you know, she just was concerned, but a lot of it was like fear and anxiety. So my job in that birth was, she was someone that did need information because everything she's saying, it's like, are we sure that's right? And it's like, yep. So this actually is a really helpful birthing position because when you're this way, your pelvis is like that. 
So it was helpful to have all of the information that I know. And that really helped her. That would not have been helpful for mom. So like, we're kind of off in the corner, you know, and I'm giving her the info, but it wasn't enough for her, for me to just say, oh, trust her body. Oh, <laughs> trust the process. It wasn't, you know, she didn't have that same connection. So she was someone that came in with a lot of, she wanted the info and that is what helped her to be able to kind of settle down and, and be a little, take up a little bit less space <laughs> in some wow. words. So it was helpful to know all of that, but that mom, you don't want to be overloaded with all of that in that moment. I would have been no, no help to her at all to educate her every contraction. No. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's exactly what I was hoping to hear from you. This, how in the world did you get into being a doula? I I got into it because, um, so my husband was, um, in the Navy active duty for about 12 years. And when I had both of my children, we were stationed in Southern Maryland and it was just us really. And I remember my own postpartum experiences. Um, and there wasn't anything like completely ridiculous, but I remember how vulnerable I felt. I remember, um, and I had, you know, I had support, you know, like I had my husband, I had a couple of friends, but it just made me think like, what are, so what are moms doing that don't really have anybody? Like, like, I feel like I was fortunate enough to even have one other person. Like what are moms doing that really don't have support? And it's such a vulnerable time. Mm -hmm. And then I learned about the health disparity with, with, I learned about just black maternal health in general, when I started digging around and how black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth or in the first year postpartum. So it's like, oh, so this is a really vulnerable population. So I looked for a training for a doula. And the first one I found, um, I mean, it was okay, but I went into it thinking that like, I will need to learn this information, synthesize it, and then make it make sense for black moms. I got to take what applies, leave the rest. And then I can give, you know, I can do it that way. And I didn't even really have to do that. The training was incredible. The, even the trainer, um, she was through Dona, but I was very surprised because that was the first thing she mentioned. It's a room full of white women and then like two other black faces. And one of the first things she said was talking about black maternal health and that disparity and to make sure that people knew that up front and to carry that with them because this is heavy work. It's not just about going to hold people's babies. Understand that these women have a different set, you know, have a different set of things happening. And we have to be mindful of that. And the issue is that we just don't listen to them. It's not because they make different choices we don't listen to them and they're dying because of it, because we don't listen. And so she really set the tone. And from there, I learned about Mama Toto Village, which was an organization that I found out works specifically with lower resourced women of color. So I, it- Can you repeat the name of the program? Yeah, it's called Mama Toto Village. It's in Washington, DC. Okay. Um, and I went there and I did a, that's where I learned how to learn my, learned about perinatal community health work and I learned the ins and outs of supporting women and childbirth and postpartum. And it was the demographic that I was literally seeking out, but it was already there. So that oh. was where I got the start. And I, I'm still with that organization um, remotely, even though I'm still in the Kansas City area. But that was kind of how it all started from my own, like, what are other people, just wondering, curious questions. What are other people doing that don't have anyone? How does that work? Wow. And then I, I ended up here. <laughs> yeah. You have such a, um, how, how should I say this? You have such a, a compassion that's combined with, I'm not going to just go into this and have total emotion take over. Mm -hmm. The content, the amount of information that you've learned about statistics with Black mothers mm -hmm. and the lack of you know, support post birth. I know those statistics. Yeah. Um, I have to say it was probably within the last two years that I read that mm -hmm. and was absolutely blown away. I think a lot of it came from some information that I was reading in the Atlanta area and um, mm -hmm. a wonderful community with a really great hospital that has a program specifically you know, paying attention to that and helping yeah. bring awareness in Atlanta. So, I mean, it's not that it's new, but you've taken this information, the need that you saw that was a lack just from your own experience of, well, wait a minute, what happens when somebody doesn't have a network of yeah. support and combined that with compassion? That is like everything I could imagine in any kind of um, 
medical care, health care, whatever, because that is, it's, it's more than just you're there as a comfort. You're mm -hmm. actually doing the part of it that looks like medical work to me. And so to be able to have your <laughs> physician, you are like a physician. I always thought I'd be a doctor and then I don't know what, like, <laughs> oh, life. <laughs> But that's what you, you don't want your physician to fall apart, dear. It's like, nope, yeah. I'm here. I'm here because I've learned what it, what you need and what it takes. And you have that gift of having compassion. Girl, you have tapped into your heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's my, and I feel like a lot of that is the, this sort of the overlay of my family. And I think that's another reason why I thought, I think why I was gravitated towards you, um, even at the beginning, because you remind me of because my family, I come from a really big close-knit family, but they're from the South. They're from Georgia. Um, and that is how we, that is like how I was raised. Like that's, that's sort of what you do. You, when you, when you see a need, what is there? What, what can we do? How can we show up for people? Like, that's just sort of the culture of my, of my family. Yeah. So it's kind of like the, just combining it all. Right. But I'm still going to have my own sort of approach to it. And for me, it's like just probably learning way too much about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't know way too much. But that's a very interesting point that you bring up is the cultural environment that we were raised in. It's so different, even just, you know, within the United States itself to see what West Coast and East Coast and the South, but that um, the community of family mm -hmm. and then you seeing, wait a minute, there's a lot of people that don't have the community of family. What do they do? What do they do? And it's, um, it, it is an issue that we've all confronted, but back, you know, century ago or however, not a century, I don't know, 50 years ago, women who quote, got in a situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying these are, I don't, I, I yeah. don't know, you know, they're single women married and whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But the whole process of um, we're just going to send you away mm -hmm. and then let's just make you feel less than mm -hmm. right off the bat. Right. Yeah. And today it's like, no, nope, this, this is life. This is what happens. Is and what whether you intend for it to or not, doesn't matter that the support is, is everything. It makes the difference in child rearing in self-esteem and I am so grateful you followed your, your head and your heart <laughs> to get yeah. into this work. And when you, it reminded me when you said that back in the day, it was different. Like that was my mom's story, like with her first two children, you know, it was the thing that was kind of, that was kind of shameful. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you have two children. You have no husband. You know, it's like wanting to not be a bad reflection on, you know, on your family or like there was just, there was just a lot more shame, but I think that also just equated to a lack of support too. You know what I mean? Like you were ashamed, but you felt it and people didn't really show up for you because it's like, well, you did this. Uh, oh, and I've never done anything, right? Yeah. You yeah. did. And it shows outwardly. Mm -hmm. Now don't look inside my heart or my head and you'll find all the things that I've You'll find all the things. So I think <laughs> that's where things. a lot of my passion came from too, because she's always been, I think it was, even though she's never said it, it's kind of like, I don't want other girls to feel the way I felt when I was a girl you know you need support I didn't I she she did have it in some ways but it's like not the ways that she I can she gives it in a way that like it would have been nice for her to have I want to meet your mama she would you would love her you guys would love her <laughs> and you can come meet mine because mm -hmm. we're in Georgia and you can come down here yes yes <laughs> down later this year <laughs> um I was gonna say some oh so let me weave my way back to the Enneagram, what you're talking about mm -hmm. in this situation with um, childbirth or, you know, pregnancy or all of the cultural things that, I mean, have been around for centuries, you know, mm -hmm. people make us look bad or you don't get the support yeah. because you did something that looks like it's out of step with the box mm -hmm. that I have to put you in. And that is why I love knowing that you and I and other people, whether we're working full-time in the Enneagram business, we are full-time 
in the caring business and understanding, wait a minute, this child responds differently. Mm -hmm. This one needs more in support because you can tell they're, they're more fearful. They're more doubting of themselves. They, they don't um, connect maybe socially as easy as one of the other children. And, mm -hmm. and so understanding whether you want to put a type to it or not, it, it doesn't matter. What I think matters is that there are enough of us now who didn't have to go to school and get a psychology degree, but we've gotten insight that says, this is where this one needs support. Yeah, she's not going to do the things like the other ones do or whichever one. Yeah, it's, it's a really incredible. And I, again, that's why I think it's such like an incredible tool because you, it does allow, like, it allows me to, to be gracious in my expectations, but I feel like the Enneagram teaches me day in and day out how to even have expectations of people. I didn't really have them before because I'm, for me, self-sufficiency is huge. Or, you know, like if I, if I, if my needs are very minimal, that means that I can probably just take care of them all. <laughs> so then it's like, I don't have a lot of expectation for others because I don't need it. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't need that, but the Enneagram just shows me how to have expectations on all of people, you know, how to value them in the way that actually makes sense for, for how they show up. So it's just, it's nice to be able to, I, I often do think of it the way that I would children where it's like, people's needs are different. Like what you were saying, this person mm -hmm. needs this, this person needs that. It's fine to tailor that. And I didn't really know. I don't think I was good at tailoring that until Enneagram work. Awareness. Enneagram has made us aware, right? And put language to, why does she do that? Why do they? <laughs> and yeah. I've said all along in any of these things that I love and learn, if it doesn't make a difference in my relationship, then what's the difference? You know, what difference yeah. does it make if it doesn't help me to see somebody with gracious expectation? <laughs> yeah, it's got it. Like, I got to do it up front. And I think the only part that I did not really connect with when it came to my Enneagram type was the, was the, the fear of like catastrophic, catastrophic depletion. But I also, I, I didn't at first, but I really think that's because I didn't, or I, I know it's because I didn't realize how, how much and how often I withhold even subconsciously. Mm. It always just kind of feels like, well, no, I'm choosing this. I'm choosing that. But it's like, I think I didn't realize how much that was happening. Like, it was like, it was almost like you're doing a good job of protecting yourself, even when you're not trying to protect yourself, you know, like you do a really good job of rationing out your energy. And it's so much so that it's just in the fiber of your very <laughs> being, you don't even realize all the times that you are cutting something off or withholding in a way. So that's very, um, Mm, a bit a good explanation as to what the type five does and I you know never want to assume that anybody who's listening understands all of the ins and outs of each type but that is part of the type five is is like you said withholding resources and it's like well what does that mean what does that mean and how do you why don't you explain that a little bit on the energy level mm -hmm. because how is it you see the description of a type five, where they say in, they're like one of the lowest energy mm -hmm. types. Do you feel? Yeah, I think that is, or at least we believe that, that we, I mean, and I think part of it is true too, <laughs> but oh. I think there's always a belief of like, I may not have enough. And I think for me, that shows up in, um, I mean, I'm a little more flexible with it. Like when I'm thinking of it, but for me, that looks like rarely ever biting off more than I can chew. Mm. Uh. Like I rarely ever, I rarely ever, I rarely ever experience overwhelm. And I thought that was because like, oh, because you like, you're really strong and you're independent, you're self-sufficient. And it's like, well, cause you'd really never put yourself in a position to be overwhelmed ever. It's always kind of like, oh no, no. So I can do this, this, and this, these last three things I cannot do. We can maybe shoot for next week. Like, you know, it's just kind of a quick, so it always looks like, oh, you're just on top of things. And it's like, well, but kind of, but on the other end of it, it's like, I rarely ever take on more than I think I can handle. And so that's the, 
when, where we get in trouble is we think everybody thinks and feels like we do. Yeah. And Why would you overextend yourself? Why would you say yes to that? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, okay. Yeah. And sometimes uh, you have to, I feel like for me, it, it helped me to connect more with those that do tend to overextend to do it sometimes. Like, even when I feel like there's not enough, it's like, no, I can commit to all that. And it's rarely ever, it rarely ever happens that I like overcommit and then still don't, I'm still not able to do everything or give everything I thought I would. I may just be more tired, but it gives me more of an appreciation for my friends, for my loved ones that consistently do that. It's like, so they are, you're literally like giving it all. Mm. You know what I mean? You're giving it all to the point of like, I have nothing left to give. And I can appreciate that more in knowing what that feels like. But I'll never feel that if I'm always kind of like, nope, nope, I stop here, I stop here. Oh, see, give me some of that. <laughs> On the other hand, let me say this about you. I know you have children, you have two children mm -hmm. and you have, you're working for two nonprofits and you do the doula work and you make yourself get up and run. I have to. <laughs> and this is what I love about somebody who's like, nope, I, I um, make sure my resources are there. I mm -hmm. make sure my energy level is right. And it's like, you and I are generations or no, we're a generation. You're the age of my daughter, but <laughs> here we are talking about using our gifts, whether it's in awareness of Enneagram or how you see somebody's energy in, in a childbirth, we are, we are putting out the best of us in the best that, ways that we can when we are in awareness. So Chandra has this Nike app, I guess it is. And it oh shows, yeah, yep, Nike yeah. Run Club. It shows <laughs> how your little running path and how mm -hmm. far and um, the time. And I'm like, dang it, I can get out there. If she can get out there and do all oh. of the things that you do. And this is what I'm saying. Our influence is in ways that we can't even imagine. Our lives our awareness, our thoughts, and the words and deeds that we do make an impact in ways that so many times we're not even aware. I just made you aware because it's like, I want you to know <laughs> you inspire me. I'm never going to run like you do. Um, but and I'm so I get out. I'm scared that, you know, that you see it when you mention like, oh yeah, I see him. And then it's like, oh, I can, I can get out and walk today. Yeah, I just didn't know if anybody even was like paying attention to that. I'm like, I should put it here. So that way I can a year from now, this will pop up. And I, if I'm still running, this will be nice. Or maybe it'll remind me to like start. <laughs> doing <this. laughs> And I never thought I'd be like a runner. And I totally connect with how they, how just a way to take care of your type of like, if you're in the head, like you got to get into your body. And I just didn't even see the point of that three years ago, you know, but now it's like, that's the fuel for all that stuff you mentioned. If I'm not running or doing something to engage with my body, then it's just like, I can't even begin to do all of that, at least not in a way that, that I would want to. You know what? That's so interesting that you say that again, because both of us are in the head triad, mm -hmm. but I'm on that very high energy scale because I'm a seven and when I would hear, you know, get into your body, you need to get in your body. I'm like, I'm never not on the run. I'm on the run. <laughs> You're I'm like, so what are you even talking about? Like, exactly. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I guess I got that one nailed. Cause look at me, I'm running from here to there. And I've got 27 <laughs> projects going and one in my head. Yeah. And it really, honestly, it was not until I started reading more about, and I won't say I'm good at somatic work or even have a handle oh, on that. Same. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when I read about what it means to get in touch with your body, it's like, I'm actually the opposite. The total, <laughs> yes. Isn't that crazy though? Cause you're like, no, 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 I'm good. I think I legitimately just, I think in the last six months, I experienced my first like gut reaction. You know how like we talked about like eights being very instinctive and even yeah. some like, even like ones like that gut reaction. Right. But I feel like I just now physically know what that feels like to like have my body or at least know what it feels like. Cause I think I'm just so used to just being kind of like dead, you know, from like, everything's up here. Everything's up but here. For real, the last like maybe six months, even the other day, like I had a friend reach out that I hadn't talked to him forever. We, things did not end well, but no. she reached out. And before I think I would have just intellectualized it and just 
oh yeah, so it's fine. We'll talk now. But for me, immediately, like my entire body, I felt it. That's never happened to me before. I've never been that in touch. It's, it wasn't like I'm angry up here. It was like, no, my body is saying, this is how you feel about this. You cannot ignore, and I can't ignore it in the way that I would have before. But I think, I honestly feel like this is in the last couple of months, my first time having a true like gut reaction to something mm. <laughs> that I couldn't shake. You know, it's like, whoa, all this is happening. Has this been happening? And I just didn't know it. And I'm pretty sure it has been. And I just, of course, we just don't pay attention to it. Yeah. So I'm not very like instinctive where it's like, no, it doesn't matter the reason I just got to go like, nope, it has to make sense to me. And for that, I didn't think for making sense. I just, what do I, I felt it all over. And it's like, I know how to respond to this because I know exactly how I feel. Ah, uh, see, I just, I love this whole thing because back to you being an inspiration to me, it's like this awareness that I finally discovered after all of these many years of, oh, just because your body's like in a frenzy of, you know, getting everything does, does not mean you're paying attention to the body. In fact, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. And really it's been this past year. I mean, I've always loved to walk and, you know, do that, but um, the awareness of what my body needs mm -hmm. and to actually stop the obsessive, you know, hamster wheel of thinking. And, um, I just, I've done my third yoga class. I just started yoga. So it's like, yoga oh, yeah. is I that is yoga this like easy thing. People are just stretching. It's fine. No, yoga. you have to really, <laughs> it was a surprise. It was quite a surprise, but I love that. I love that you're doing that. It's never too late, but, um, okay. I am going to put all the information if somebody wants to reach you and whatever you don't want me to include, I will not. <laughs> it's like, nope, I don't want all the people <laughs> contacting me. But yeah, we'll put it in the show notes and I'll put it out on Instagram because I just, you are a gift to me and a gift in more ways than you even are aware. And I want people to be aware because you have- Thank you so much for- saying that people like you help that helps a lot to get out of to be out of your head my best friend told me like so when you think you kind of don't know enough about something it's going to be more than everybody else already so just go with that and it's like okay like that's helpful to just so even when you say you're a gift and it's like yep I do I know and it's fine I'm always going to learn more but like I know enough just move forward or what I have is enough somebody needs even if it's just a little that's good enough for yeah and uh, being able to, at this point, say, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I don't know it all, but this is what I do now. And I'm good with what I know. So let's move on together. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for, for saying that and sharing that. I just love you. And I thank you for your time. Thank and you for inviting me and for inviting me to do this. Never would have done it otherwise. So well, you got to keep a seven in your life because they will just, <laughs> they'll have you doing new things. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's why. When you come to Georgia, you better call me next time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next time we'll have more time. We went the last time it was like two days, like turnaround trip. So we will absolutely have more time this summer. I hope so. I do. But I'm glad our paths have crossed, even if it's um, just virtual right now. But I connect with your energy and your spirit. And I just thank you. Thank you. And go have a great weekend. You too. You this too. is Friday. It is <laughs> my favorite day. Yay. And I'll talk right. to you soon. Pardon me? And I'll I said I'll talk to you soon. Oh yes. Oh yes. I will see you on the in the web or out, out there somewhere. Okay. Thank you so much. Talk no to you problem. soon. Bye. Bye.